greetings, and welcome back. Uh, we are continuing our study on Wednesday nights of praising God from the Psalms. We're looking at several of the Psalms, and we're looking uh, specifically at Psalms 146 through 150. Uh, they conclude the Psalter, or the Book of Psalms, and they each conclude uh, with this word of praise to God. They each begin with the phrase, praise the Lord, and end with the phrase, praise the Lord, which uh, would be the R word, hallelujah. Uh, that, that's what that word is in Hebrew. It's a, it's a way of praising God for who he is and for what he has done. And they each kind of give a different shade of ways and reasons to praise God. However, there are some themes that remain consistent. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at Psalm 148. And as we look at Psalm 148, we're going to see some of those themes emerge that we've already discussed a couple of times. If, for example, if you look at Psalm 148 and verse 13... It'll say, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name, his alone, is sublime. His splendor covers, and then notice the phrase, heaven and earth. His praise, or his splendor, covers heaven and earth. Um, if you've been reading through these psalms, uh, you've been perhaps noticing that they tend to deal with heaven and earth. In fact, if you look at Psalm 146, in verse 5, it says, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help whose hope is in the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So notice it'll talk about heaven and earth, and then it'll start talking about the sea and all that's in the sea. Uh, if you look at Psalm 147 and verse, uh, start in 7, it says, Sing to the Lord a song of praise. Chant a hymn with a lyre to our God, who covers the heavens with cloud and provides rain on the earth, makes uh, mountains put forth grass and gives to the beasts their food. And notice he'll talk again about the heavens and the earth. And then he'll talk about some of the animals that live on the heaven. Now, one of the things that we discussed last time in Psalm 147 was this is a psalm reminding people of the goodness of God. And the, the logic of it is kind of like this. If God loves and cares for his creation, his world that he made, enough to fill it with beauty, with beauty and mountains and hills and grass, enough to clothe the hills with grass, enough to uh, make sure that the animals that run wild, that, that they don't you know uh, sow or reap or anything like that, but he makes sure that they have food provided for them. God can speak a command and the snow falls and he can speak another word and the snow will melt away. And like all of this, all of the weather changes, all of the leaves on all of the trees, all the grass on all the hills, like creation itself is a reminder that God actually cares for the creation that he made and the world that he made. God likes it. In fact, in Genesis 1, it says, even before he created man, that it was good. God liked the things that he made. He made them functional. He made them purposeful. He had tasks and reasons for the th things that he made, and he likes those things. But here's the deal. He did create those things in his image. He created those things, and he likes those things, and he cares for those things. But mankind is who he created in his image, and mankind was chosen to rule over those things. So if God cares for those things, how much more will he care for the part of his creation that is created in his own image, which is us? So what the psalm is basically saying is as you go through your life and you see the beautiful hills and you see the grass and you see the flowers and you see the trees and you see animals and you see birds and you see all these things, remember that God loves his world. And even more than that, God loves you. God cares for you. God is with you. God provides for the world. God will provide for you because you're a part of his creation too. And you are the height of his creation. And so it's kind of like arguing from the lesser to the greater. Well, you know, if it, Jesus does this type of thing, in fact, he does it uh, making this same point in uh, Matthew 6, where he says, uh, you know, consider the lilies of the field or consider the birds of the air. You know, that God, like, the, God has clothed lilies with more beauty and splendor than, like, any human being has ever dressed. God cares for the birds to make sure that they have food. It's like, God is caring for flowers. God is caring for birds. So certainly, he'll care for you also, because he cares for you, the logic goes, even more than the flowers and the birds. It's not that he doesn't care for those things. It's that he loves those things, but he loves you even more. And so by seeing how he cares for those things, you get this grand picture of how much more 
God even cares for you. Uh, Jesus has a similar like line of reasoning and the logic from lesser to greater when he talks about prayer. And he says, which of you, if your son asks for an egg, would give him a scorpion? You know, like if your son asks for something, you would give him something so much worse, right? No, if you're a father, you want to give good things to your children and to your sons, right? And to your daughters. Well, if God is a better father, then wouldn't he even be better at answering our requests and giving us things? So like the idea is if bad fathers on this earth, which, you know, we like to think that there are some good dads, but in reality, in comparison to God, none of us are good dads. Uh, like God is the greatest father of all. Uh, and so if you were to say, if we would do a good job at giving our sons what they need, certainly God, who's a greater father than all of us could do it, right? It's arguing from the lesser to the greater. And I think that's what Psalm 147 is doing. It's saying, if you look at how God cares for his creation, that's a constant daily reminder of how much he cares and loves for you. And so creation should fill you with, with hope that you have a God who loves and cares for you. Psalm 148, I think, continues a very similar theme. Uh, it talks again about God and the heavens and the earth that he made. So like Psalm 148, the passage we read, his splendor covers heaven and earth. So we've already seen God talk about heavens and earth in Psalm 145, Psalm 1, uh, or Psalm 146, 147, and now Psalm 148. That's creation uh, language. That's Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When you're talking about the heavens and the earth, you're talking about God's creation. And Psalm 148 is going to take us through the heavens for like the first half of it and the earth for the second half of it, and discuss what we can learn about God from looking at the heavens and from looking at the earth. Only what's different than Psalm 147 is that Psalm 148 focuses not as much on God providing for heaven and earth, but rather heaven and earth's response to God. So Psalm 147 was about how like God cares for heaven and earth. Psalm 148 is about how heaven and earth worships and praises God in return. And that might sound a little odd to you, uh, but I think that's because we have forgotten a very prominent and very important biblical theme that's throughout scripture, that creation itself matters. You can learn about God from looking at creation. You can learn valuable truths of God by looking at the world that he made and the world that God made, both heaven and earth, uh, is actually a great example of what worship and obedience is supposed to be like. What I mean by that is, if God tells it to rain, the world doesn't say no. If God tells it to snow, the world doesn't say, ah, I have my own plans, right? The world is going to obey what God tells the world to do. Uh, humans, on the other hand, God could say, don't eat from the tree of this or the fruit of this tree. And humans might say, no, God could say uh, all sorts of things. Don't steal. And humans can say no. So creation is actually a better example of obedience to God than humanity is. So if you want to look at what it means to obey God, you look at the world around you, right? And at the same time, the world, and this is a concept that I think we should, we should get in our heads. Uh, the world, though we think of it as inanimate and non-living is just like dead rocks and dirt or you can talk about trees but like we're talking about like the world itself it's not something that can actually worship or praise god is the way we think of it that's not the way that the bible talks about it in fact over and over and over again you could i i suppose you could say that it's just uh you know uh you know personification or something like that or a literary device but it's pretty consistent throughout the Bible. And so even if it's just a literary device, it's one we should take seriously and should perhaps form our theology around that the world itself, the heavens and the earth, praises God in return. Uh, you see that in the book of Revelation. Uh, everything that is on earth, everything that is in the sea, everything that is under the sea, it all praises the one who sits on the throne and praises the lamb forevermore. Um in Romans chapter one, uh, Paul gives this teaching that like you can, the invisible attributes of God, his divine power and, and, and Godhead are seen in the world that he made. The invisible things are seen through the visible things. You say, what visible things? The world around us, his creation. His creation is constantly personified. In fact, in Romans eight, later in that same book, 
Paul uses creation again to say that creation is longing for and and if it's it's day of redemption where it won't be subjected to futility and the curse any longer. And like you see that creation is often given thoughts and feelings and motives and ideas and all that stuff in the Bible. Creation is often spoken of that way. And Psalm 48, 148 rather, is no exception. And it's going to talk about how creation worships God. And so when you see the stars twinkling in the sky, you're seeing the creation and in all of its beauty responding back in praise to God. When you hear the babbling of a brook, you're hearing the sound of waters giving their praise to God. When you see and hear the wind and the trees rustling and that sound, think of that sound as praise to God. And I tell you what developing that type of mindset uh, can do for you. It can remind you every day that God is worthy of praise. If you hear a tree and you think that tree is praising God right now, it'll remind you to praise God right now. If you hear a creek and you think that creek, that sound is the sound of worship to God, then perhaps it'll motivate you to worship God. Uh, I don't think that's taking this too far. I think it's developing a mindset that says God teaches about himself and all sorts of things. Scripture, we know scripture is something you go to and you learn about God. But the Bible repeatedly has the idea, read Psalm 8, you'll see it. Read Psalm 19, read Psalm 104. Like these Psalms are entrenched with the idea that creation itself is a way that you learn to praise God. Uh, creation itself is a reminder to worship God. Creation itself is praising God all the time. And just like creation obeys God, when God says, let there be light, there is light, and humans sometimes don't obey God. Uh, in the same way, creation worships God, and it's sometimes humans who don't worship God. Uh, and so these are challenges to us. And I think those are the types of things that David was talking about in Psalm 8 when he was looking at the stars of heaven. And he began to think, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you're concerned about him? Uh, but you've crowned him with glory and honor and you've made him to rule over the works of your hands. Uh, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's like you look at the earth and you see the majesty of God everywhere. And it reminds us, why did God... Like of all the beauty and the size and the grandeur and the greatness of this earth, why does he love and care for me? I don't know exactly. Why did he choose us? I'm not sure, but that comes with the responsibility. It's a responsibility that because God lovingly chose us and has blessed us and has made us rule over the work of his hands and has made us just a little lower than the Elohim, perhaps we ought to respond back with praise and worship and obedience to our God. I think that's a powerful reminder, and I think that's one you can get from looking at the world around you. So with some of those things in mind, I want to read Psalm 148, and we'll make a few notes as we go through. But notice how he begins the psalm talking about the heavens, and then he'll move on to the earth. So it's a psalm of the praise of the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. God cares for the heavens and the earth. Uh, the heavens and the earth obeys God, and the heavens and the earth worship God. And uh, all of those themes can be seen in Genesis 1, Psalm 147, and Psalm 148. So, Psalm 148, verse 1, beginning with the heavens. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him on high. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all bright stars. Praise him, highest heavens and you waters that are above the heavens. Let, the pray, let them praise the name of the Lord, for it is he who commanded that they be created. He made them endure forever, establishing an order that shall never change. Okay, so uh, the first six verses are about the heavens, and then the next uh, uh, couple are going to be about the earth. But notice a couple of things in here. One, when he talks about the heavens, he's talking about all the heavenly realm. And uh, when the heavenly realm is spoken of, you'll often see uh, things from perhaps different sectors of our brain emerging. Like, for example, sun and moon and stars and uh, like angels and, and the hosts of heaven and things like that. He, he tends to put them in the same category as he talks about the heavens. And so uh, one of the things that you'll see when he goes through the heavens and he goes through the earth is he'll talk about the objects that are in the heavens, but then also the beings that are in the heavens. Then when he talks about the earth, he'll talk about the objects that are on the earth, and then he'll talk about the beings that are on the earth, and how both objects and beings are engaged in this praise to God. 
So, like, the beings, uh, verse 2, he talks about the angels and the hosts. Um, when he Then he'll talk about uh, the sun and moon and the bright stars, and, and he'll talk about the heavens and then the water above the heavens. Um, if you're curious about that, go back and read Genesis chapter 1. A lot of this psalm is based on Genesis 1. The words, heavens and the earth, come from Genesis 1.1. He'll talk about the waters that are above the heavens. And if you remember uh, on day, let's see, 2 it is, uh, where God... On day one says, let there be light, and there was light. And then on day two, he took the waters that were, uh, he made an expanse, right, called the heavens. And he took some waters that were below it, and then he put other waters above it. So that there's waters above the expanse and waters below the expanse. Um, and uh, he, what he's saying is, both of those waters are going to praise God. Uh, and everything in those waters, and the expanse of the heavens in the middle of those waters, and above where you see the sky and the star and the sun, and like, all of that is praising God. In fact, even the messengers of God and the, the beings of God, the angels of God are praising and worshiping God. So when you're looking up into the heavens, you're seeing this panoply of praise to God. Every star is a reminder of praise to God, the sun and the moon. Now, in other con cultures and in other ancient contexts, people would worship the sun and the moon and they would worship the stars and they would worship these different things as though they were gods. And what God is saying is in the real cosmological structure of the universe. God is the one who singularly is praised, and he is praised by the sun and the moon and the stars. So the sun and the moon and the stars aren't things that we worship. No, the sun and the moon and the stars are things that worship God. And we ought to join them in that heavenly chorus. We ought to join them in that worship and praise. And so it's a way of, uh, in some ways, uh, subverting the cultures around them that would worship the sun and the moon and the stars by saying, God is so great that the things you worship actually worship God. The sun and the moon and the stars were created by God, commanded by God, and what they do, they do because God ordered them to do it. So if you look at verse 6, he says, He made them endure forever, establishing an order that shall never change. Um, every morning that you wake up and the sun is rising, it's a reminder of that order. It's a reminder of God taking a world of darkness and shining his light on it. You know that uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Right? There was darkness, it was over the face of the deep, but then God said, let there be light, and light appeared. Well, every single day is a reminder of that right there, as there's darkness and then light appears. Every day is a reminder of God's care for his creation, of God's powerful creative abilities, and that's going to happen, and it's going to happen tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day too, and it's, it's happened in the past, it'll happen in the future. Those are the decrees of God, and that's what it's saying, like, he established an order that you could always rely upon. You'll that These are things that you can always put your hope and your trust in, and it reminds you of the constancy of God, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, I think you can see that aspect of God in his creation, in the order of creation, in the, the jobs that creation has. I mean, if you remember reading through the creation account in Genesis 1, uh, the greater light, which would be the sun, and the lesser light, which we would, which we would call the moon, uh, and then the stars, they had jobs they were supposed to govern and to rule when it was day and when it was night. Like these are, are uh, things God made that have a purpose in God's creation. And that purpose he established in those, those governing authorities uh, of the sun and the moon and all of that. Uh, they give us seasons. They give us all of the stuff by which time can, can be, uh, you know, you can tell time and you can move from one season to the next. But all of that was established by God. And when you see those things, it's a reminder that God is in control of his creation. Uh, so then verse 7 is where we move from talking about what you learn about God from the heavens and how all of the heavens praise him. And all the jobs that they have are ways that they praise and glorify God. And the sounds that you hear are sounds of glory and praise to God. Uh, verse 7 says, Praise the Lord, all you who are on the earth. Okay, so he started with the, the heavens, and now he's talking, so like, Chapter 48 and verse 1, praise the Lord from the heavens. And then he mentions all the things in the heavens. Then verse 7, praise the Lord all on the earth. And then he mentions all the things on the earth. And then as he concludes in Psalm uh, 148, 13, his splendor covers the heavens and the earth. 
And so this whole psalm is like, is these are the sections of it. And so now we're getting into the earth section. In verse 7, he says, uh, all you on the earth, all sea monsters in ocean depths. And so he's going to talk about on the earth, including the sea and the earth and everything in the sea. So if you look up like sea monsters, you'll see in Genesis 1 uh, that he created the sea monsters. He created all the things in the earth and he or on, the, on the sea and then the birds that fly above um, and uh, ocean depths. By the way, the ocean's incredible. Uh, I, I, I have never gone on a whale watching uh uh, tour, which I think would be pretty cool, but I do sometimes look at videos, and if I start watching videos of whales or videos of like great white sharks or some of the things that are in the ocean, it is astounding to me the massive, massive living creatures that we have in our oceans, and just how powerful and like like untamable they are. Uh, and uh, it's a reminder when you see something of that much magnitude and strength, like a blue whale, it's just incredible to think of how huge those are. And you remember that God is the one who merely can speak a word and things like that appear. God is greater and more powerful than anything, even the greatest monsters of the sea and the ocean depths. Verse eight, fire and hail, snow and smoke. Uh, so if you remember, snow was in Psalm 147 and verse 16 is talking about God sends out his word and he lays down snow like fleece and scatters frost like ashes. Well, here he's in uh, Psalm 148 and verse 8, he talks about fire and hail, snow and smoke. Uh, these are things that come from God. Storm winds that execute his command. Uh, so again, Psalm 147, it talked about God lays out his word and his command runs swiftly in verse 15. Uh, like when you see the seasons change, they're changing at the word and the command of God. Uh, well, Psalm 148 in verse 8, he's talking about stormy winds come and go at the word and the command of God. Verse 9 all mountains and hills, all fruit trees and cedars. So all of these things are being called upon to praise God. And he's talked about some of the objects uh, we might call like the trees and the weather and things like that. But then also the beings that are uh, within them, like the monsters of the sea. And, uh, and uh, verse 10, all wild and tamed beasts, creeping things and winged birds. Uh, so this is also language, like the creeping things and, and uh, the beasts and all that stuff from, from Genesis chapter 1. And it's talking about all the things that God made are things that praise God. Um, when you see get to verse 9, it talks about all mountains and hills. Like when you see mountains and just the majesty of a massive snow-capped mountain or something like that, you're seeing that feeling you get, I think it's something that very naturally should be turned into praise. Not for the mountain, but into praise for God, because God's the one who created such beauty and majesty and grandeur and splendor, because it all comes from the beauty and majesty and, and uh, splendor and grandeur of God himself. And so when you're looking at creation, that like the awe-inspiring feeling you get from looking at the beauty of creation, I think is merely like a small microcosm or a small, uh, uh, tiny picture of the greatness and grandeur and glory of God. And so it should remind you to turn into praise our God as you go through this life. When it talks about fruit trees, you have some trees that produce fruits and then it talks about cedars, some trees that are strong and sturdy. They built the temple out of cedars, you know, that was out of the cedars of Lebanon, the most impressive trees that they knew of. Uh, and, and so when you see like strong, impressive trees, remember the strength and, and the might of our God uh, and, and all of creation itself can remind us to turn and to praise God. Then verse 11 he stops from talking about weather and mountains and trees and animals. And he starts talking about people now, uh, kind of like in Genesis, uh, in Genesis, you have let there be light. And then you have the heavens that are made in day two. And you have like the sea and the earth. And uh, then you have the, the stars and all that stuff that fill the earth in day four. And then you have uh, the animals that are, I guess the, the, uh, the be the birds that fly in the air and you have uh, the animals in the sea in day five and then day six you have the animals on the earth but then last of all you get to people on day six when god creates them in his image and if you follow through what psalm 148 you get all of those things at first and then you get to people in verse 11 and he mentions 
kings and peoples of the earth, all princes of the earth and all its uh, judges. So like the most powerful people on earth, you know what they ought to do? They ought to stop whatever they're doing and start praising God. Uh, kings and rulers and judges and princes. Then verse uh, 12, <clears throat> youths and maidens alike, young and old together. So like young children, mighty old kings and everyone in between, male, female, rich, poor, eh, all people are called in this psalm to give praise to God. And then verse, uh, one thir or verse 13 and 14 concludes the psalm. Let them praise the name of the Lord. All right, this is for everyone. This is for everything, animate, inanimate, uh, human, non-human, everything that God created, including angels, including stars, including the sky, including waters, including uh, the animals that are in on earth, the animals that are in the sea, the weather and all the weather patterns, kings, children, men, women, everything in between. Let them praise the name of the Lord for his name, his alone is sublime. If you're going to praise anything, Praise God, for his splendor covers heaven and earth and everything therein. Uh, that's what this psalm is about. Verse 14 ends with a word of encouragement to Israel, and I think could be a word of encouragement to us also. He has exalted the horn of his people, the horn being representative of the power of his people, for the glory of all his faithful ones, Israel, his people close to him, Praise the Lord or hallelujah. Um, as God's people today, uh, I think it's a helpful reminder that the God who can create all of that merely by speaking a word and the God who is praised by all of that is the God who's on our side and the God who loves us and the God who uses his might and power for his people who are closest to him. That's a powerful reminder, especially as you go through tragedy or uh, the world around us sometimes is unpredictable and it's hard to know exactly what the future holds. Here's what you can trust. You have a God who is greater than all things, who created all things and cares for and loves all things, including you. And you have a God who is so worthy of praise that all things respond back to God in praise. The stars of the heaven and the sun and the moon, they're not things to be worshipped. Those are things that cower in worship to God. Uh, the mountains, the mightiest mountain you've ever seen isn't to be worshipped, but the mountain itself worships and praises God. Like all creation, all people, all animals, all stars, even the angels are all those who in reverence ought to bow down before the creator of all things. He's the one who is mightier than everything else, and he's the one who loves you and who is there for you. So trust in that, hope in that. I love you, and may the love of God be with you.